after transplant, what we do is very different. Most of our post-transplant management is plumbing related. Uh, and the reason for that is that other than um, rejection, the thing that's most likely to threaten a transplanted organ is, is uh, an injury to its blood supply. Now the liver is unique because of course it has multiple vessels coming in, it has uh, a vessel going out and it also has biliary ducts, so there's a lot of plumbing to do in the liver. But uh, we, we get involved in treating uh, renal transplants and at hospitals that do lung transplants there are also techniques for treating uh, stenoses that develop at their anastomotic sites. So. Um, we, we do angioplasty and stenting for narrowings. Uh, in the case of, of thrombosis, we can do thrombolysis. I also have a good example of an endograft in a patient who had a pseudoaneurysm. So just a, a couple of images here. This is mostly just a pictographic uh, series. Um, this is a patient who had <coughs> recurrent stenosis in the hepatic artery right here. You can see that he's had some biliary complications because he's got a biliary stent in place. And that's what happens when the hepatic artery fails in a transplant, a liver transplant, the, uh, the biliary system dies off. And so this is a patient who had been angioplastied a few times and, and didn't get a durable result. So in this particular case, we did a stent and here's the result afterwards. And this wound up being a durable result for this particular patient who uh, has done very well since the time of this procedure. He was transiently on uh, Plavix and is not anymore and has not had a recurrence uh, of his stenosis, although he does still have some biliary injury from his original events. Uh, here's a renal transplant. Uh, and just to draw in the organ there, uh, you can see that the anastomosis is to the external iliac artery. There's a stenosis just beyond the anastomotic point. Uh, this was treated with a stent. Here's the post stent angioplasty, you can see that there's been a significant improvement from this appearance to this appearance. Again, this is the kind of thing that once you've done it, uh, tends to have a very durable result. Generally, we will put these patients on anticoagulants for a short period of time, but it's not something that they generally need lifelong. And uh, so this is a cure for this particular patient whose kidney was otherwise at grave risk. Now, in transplant, the uh, liver transplant, things can become a lot more complicated. Uh, I honestly don't understand how you guys can possibly make those anastomoses behind the liver. I mean, it's pretty impressive. But every once in a while, you get an outcome like this, where uh, this patient has a narrowing both at the hepatic vein here and in the inferior vena cava. Both of these had been angioplastied on multiple previous occasions and had recurred. And so what we did in this patient was, oh boy, this doesn't show at all, does it? was to uh, stent both vessels, put a, a large uh, self-expanding stent into the IVC, and then went through the side of it and put in a balloon expandable stent in the hepatic vein. And uh, you know, again, for this patient, this is, this is a definitive treatment. This is all that this patient needed to decompress the hepatic venous system, get rid of the uh, uh, veno-obstructive pathology that, that uh, had been compromising this transplant, and he's gone on and done well with this. Now, it's not always the uh, hepatic vein. Sometimes it can be the portal vein. This is a, a portal venous stenosis. In this particular case, we've uh, accessed the portal vein um, with a uh, transabdominal approach, basically a, uh, the same approach we would use for a biliary drain. And you can see our catheter through the stenotic segment, which is obviously here. And here's how it looks after placement of a self-expanding stent. I believe we went back and dilated this afterwards and it looked even better, but I don't have a picture of that, so maybe not. But this is, this is again, a, the kind of thing that can be done easily, quickly. This is an outpatient procedure, and this saves the patient both uh, a trip back to the operating room for repair of this and potentially the liver itself. Now, <clears throat> here's a little bit more of a, an emergent situation. This is a patient who is immediately post-transplant, you can see the staples are still there in the abdominal wall, and this patient has acute thrombosis of the hepatic artery. Now, uh, so here's a, here's a catheter that's been advanced into the hepatic artery. Uh, there's the gastroduodenal artery. The hepatic should continue up here and branch, and it, it doesn't. In a patient who has not had a liver transplant, this is something that you don't worry about too much. In fact, you probably don't even notice it when it happens. But in a patient who has a, uh, a liver transplant, this is a, this is a terrible complication. 
And um, the, if you don't treat this, if you can't restore hepatic arterial flow, the short-term death rate's as high as 20%, and another 50, 60% will go on to develop uh, chronic biliary problems that may subsequently cause the liver to fail. So this is something that needs to be treated right away. Um, if possible, in the immediate post-procedure, post-transplant period, these patients will go back to the operating room. But in this particular case, what we did was to advance a catheter through the clotted segment and do a thrombolysis procedure. Uh, that's, those uh, are just supposed to show the staples in case you hadn't noticed them already. And this is what the patient looked like after thrombolysis. So you can see it's now wide open good flow through the entire length of the artery and out into the parenchymal branches. So this brings up a, uh, a question. I guess I, my slides are going to show this later. Uh, we'll talk about uh, the risk of bleeding in the immediate post-operative period here shortly, I guess. First, here's another case. This is a patient with a portal venous thrombosis. In this particular case, we've advanced our catheter down uh, through the hepatic vein into the portal vein in a sort of a, a typical TIPS approach. And this is what it looks like when we first access the portal vein. Here's what it looks like after thrombolysis. So we've now again reestablished antegrade flow. This is not a normal looking portal vein. I can't remember. We may have put a stent there or angioplasty that. But uh, when you have an acute thrombosis, this is the typical outcome. You get into the clot, you lyse it, it's open, and, uh, and you can salvage a, a, a liver or a kidney that otherwise might not survive. So post-operative thrombolysis, is it contraindicated? Uh, it depends. In general, um, we have assumed that it's always too dangerous to lyse patients right after surgery. But I can tell you I've done thrombolysis of a thrombosed superior vena cava the same day as a heart transplant. And I've done uh, catheter-directed thrombolysis in hepatic arteries like this one within hours or days of transplant on multiple occasions. And you do it when you have to do it, is what it comes down to. Now, if the patient's had intracranial surgery, then it's probably too dangerous to do uh, thrombolysis in the immediate post-operative period, because there's no room for any blood if, if you do have hemorrhage. But the fact is that in the abdomen, um, it's really not that dangerous. You obviously have to be aware of the fact that the patient may bleed. You have to consent, for the, patient, uh, consent the patient for the possibility of bleeding. Uh, it's helpful if there's a drain right next to the site that you're treating so that if there is bleeding, you recognize it early. But um, in a case like this, uh, if the hepatic artery is occluded in the acute post-operative period, you lyse it. Now, this is an interesting case. This is a patient who, again, had had a very complicated uh, course. He'd had multiple revisions of his hepatic artery. I believe he'd had two transplants already. Uh, this particular hepatic artery is actually uh, anastomose to his iliac artery. And you can see that there are problems with it. It's got a lot of irregularities. As a result of that, he developed a biliary complication that resulted in placement of a biliary drain. And unfortunately, that biliary drain caused a hepatic artery pseudoaneurysm. So this is a guy who's a terrible uh, surgical candidate. Uh, the last thing they want to do is go in and operate on him again. And yet, he's already having some bleeding from his biliary drain. Uh, you can't see it in this image, but he, he did. And this is, this is a, a very dangerous lesion. This is the kind of thing that could, that could cause the patient to exsanguinate in a very short period of time. So what we were able to do in him is to place a uh, coronary endograft. These are very small caliber um, devices that can go out into small vessels. And here you see it, uh, a close up of it after it's been deployed obviously right next to the biliary drainage catheter. And here's what the vasculature looks like after it's placed. This is about 10 minutes after the first slide I showed you. So he has complete resolution of his pseudoaneurysm. And this patient, unfortunately, died of, of uh, failure of, of this liver about six months later. But his hepatic artery was still patent at that time. Not all the strictures we deal with are vascular. Um, this is one from, uh, I actually got this out of a a journal article because I've never done one. But if you do lung transplants, you can get strictures in the, uh, uh, in the bronchial tree. And this is a patient whose bronchial anastomosis was stented. 
much more typical for us is patients who have strictures in the biliary system after liver transplantation. So <clears throat> here's a, a before and after. The patient uh, has a, an asthmatic or clamp injury here. And here it is after angioplasty with a balloon that was introduced through the same approach that we use, basically a uh, flank approach that we use for the portal vein case I showed earlier. These are actually difficult lesions to treat. They frequently require dilatation uh, over and over again and prolonged uh, presence of an internal external drainage catheter. <clears throat> but, you know, that's, that's a pretty good alternative to going back and trying to fix this surgically, especially in a patient who's already uh, undergone multiple procedures in the past. We can do the same thing with the uh, urinary collecting system. So here's an angioplasty of a, uh, uh, a stricture in the distal aspect of a ureter, uh, sorry, the distal aspect of the ureter in a renal transplant. Again, placement of an internal stent for a while afterwards to allow it to recover. But those are very effective techniques that can prevent the need for a trip back to the operating room. Now, it's actually possible for IR to be involved in the transplant itself in one particular case. I don't know if there's any interest here in doing pancreatic islet cell transplants. But the premise of a pancreatic islet cell transplant is that you take the, uh, the islet cells from the patient's own pancreas prior to pancreatectomy for chronic pancreatitis or from uh, another person if they just happen to be diabetic. <clears throat> and uh, then you take those cells, you prepare them appropriately, and you inject them into the portal vein where they establish uh, functioning colonies, basically. And you can reproduce the endocrine function of the pancreas, not the exocrine function. So you're not producing any digestive enzymes that serve any purpose, but you can uh, produce enough insulin to correct or at least improve diabetes in, in some patients. So this is a schematic here that shows how it works. Basically, the pancreatic cells are harvested. They're prepared appropriately. They're injected into the portal vein. They establish little colonies of cells and produce hormones that pass out into the portal vein and are absorbed and perform their function. Um, now, the outcomes haven't been great. If you look at a study that was done in allergenic transplants, 44% um, of them were insulin independent for at least some period of time but only 28% had even partial graft function after a year. And um, so it, it, it winds up being somewhat uh, disappointing in terms of uh, treating primary diabetes. On the other hand, in patients who have pancreatic tissue harvested during pancreatectomy that's done for chronic pancreatitis, so they're getting their own cells back, and obviously the risk of rejection is uh, reduced. Um, one third of those patients can wind up being insulin independent, and another third will have enough function preserved in their islet cells that, um, that their diabetes is mild and may be controllable with oral agents alone. So uh, the conclusion, at least of this paper, was that it's something that should be used more widely for patients who are having pancreatic resections. Um, just summarizing, you know, it's important to remember that interventional radiology is something that starts uh, or that can have a role well before a transplant actually occurs. Uh, has a lot of, uh, of use in terms of maintaining patients in a transplantable status, uh, getting them uh, through their symptoms, their major symptoms, until a transplant becomes available. And, uh, and then can play a role for years indefinitely after transplant to help transplanted organs uh, stay alive and functioning. Now the islet cell transplant is, uh, is something that I think is interesting. I don't know, again, if there's any interest in, in pursuing that here, but it's something that uh, we would be happy to discuss uh, with you guys going forward. So thank you for your time. Sorry we got a little bit of a late start. <laughs>